Smart cities are meant to improve the lives of city dwellers. But these systems require huge amounts of data to work. How is this data collected? And what are the potential pitfalls? Smart cities, big data, that's our topic today on SHIFT. Around the world, major efforts are underway to improve life in big cities. Entirely new cities have been designed to revolve around tech, like Konza in Kenya, Songdo International Business District in South Korea and Forest City Johor in Malaysia. But centuries-old cities like Amsterdam also want to adapt to become smart. Smart cities are designed to conserve water and energy and eliminate traffic jams. That's made possible by big data and IoT applications. Network devices that communicate and exchange data, like traffic lights, water meters and trash bins. American urbanist and author Anthony Townsend explains the value of big data. I think it's, it's really the lifeblood of cities today and uh, will be um, you know, the bricks and mortar that we use to construct cities in the future. Big data as the lifeblood of cities, that's an intriguing image. Many cities are overcrowded, which means traffic jams are inevitable, like in Amsterdam. That's where big data comes in. We sent our reporters Paul Jäger and Kilian Bayer to the Dutch capital to find out more. Amsterdam is known for being one of Europe's most bicycle-friendly cities. But that doesn't mean it's free from cars or traffic jams. So if you look at the, the cities that we now live in and also uh, Amsterdam in, in particular, uh, we are still addicted to, uh, to vehicles and, uh, and combustion engine uh, vehicles. So what we still see is a lot of uh, noise pollution, air pollution, greenhouse gas emissions and traffic jams. Traffic jams often stem from poor traffic management. In smart cities, vehicles and lights can communicate directly to prevent jams from occurring in the first place. Such systems are being tested in the province of North Holland, where Amsterdam is located. Part of smart mobility is that we digitize the infrastructure and we connect everything to each other. What we're experimenting with are the intelligent traffic lights. We estimate that you can get around 15% increase of efficiency in traveling uh, across an intersection. To make traffic flow more efficiently, vehicles can be grouped together in so-called platoons. They form a platoon by communicating and they also uh, communicate to the traffic light that the platoon is approaching. And then you can have multiple trucks uh, cross through a green light, which saves a lot of fuel. Because a big truck stopping and starting again could cost one liter of diesel. Here's how the sensors work at an intersection. So what you see here is a 5G communication modem, which sends out information about the traffic lights, about the colors and the predictions. And with that, the cars can adjust their speed. This modem has a range of 200, 500 meters. And over that range, it shares information about the light, the cues, and uh, the time at which the traffic light will change. And then the car can adjust the speed accordingly. So, help from 5G could make my morning commute traffic jam-free not bad. But imagine if these interconnected sensors were hacked, then what? Ensuring cybersecurity in smart cities is paramount. A hacker can wreak havoc by manipulating just one single person's phone or computer. Now just imagine if the data of millions of people were hacked, possibly at the same time. Anthony Townsend, an expert on smart cities and information technology, fears the consequences of such an incident would be dire. I expect every single day to wake up and see news that the Chernobyl of smart cities has happened somewhere in the world. We are primed for that to happen. It is, it's inevitable and it's imminent. The 1986 Chernobyl disaster at a Soviet nuclear power station had devastating and far-reaching fallout. Anthony Townsend is bracing for the digital equivalent of such a catastrophe. He likens an impending collapse of smart city infrastructure to the set of circumstances that resulted in the deadly crashes of Boeing aircrafts. I think the best way to understand it is um, 
think about what happened with the, the Boeing 737 MAX. We have built a system that's layered on top of an older system and not really um, understood what it is that we're, we're building. Uh, and we haven't been able to test it in all the failure scenarios because we're flying it at the same time that we're building it and testing it. Anthony Townsend points to a lack of oversight as part of the problem. The companies that have been building it, like Boeing, have been more or less regulating themselves. And so I think, um, you know, we're, we're finding out what the failure modes are by, by running it. Uh, unfortunately, like Boeing, we're running it with passengers inside of it. Um, and unfortunately, instead of having 200 passengers, we have two, 2 million or 20 million passengers. A crash landing with 20 million passengers, that's not exactly the image I'd like to associate with a smart city. So how do developers see such security threats? Tech consultant and entrepreneur Markus Punstein weighs in. The risk is real. Like every server on the internet is prone to be hacked. We have to take all kinds of measurement in order to avoid being hacked. And one is that, that, that the servers are um, ISO qualified. When a server is ISO certified, that means it meets the standards of the International Organization for Standardization, or ISO. ISO slash IEC 27001, for example, includes rules on data encryption, stopping unauthorized persons from accessing servers, and preventing data loss. A key to the safe use of big data is the standardization of global regulations. Keeping to standards such as ISO is how Markus Punstein and his colleagues protect their systems from cyber threats. One of the projects he is working on with other partners is the Crowd Insights Monitor. This is to avoid overcrowding in public spaces, an important aim, and not only during a pandemic. Marina Terrain is a tech hub in Amsterdam and testing ground for innovative ideas. In summers, this area is packed with people, but how to know when it's at capacity? The COVID-19 pandemic has already shown the risks overcrowding can pose to public health, and congested public spaces can also be dangerous in the event of a mass panic or terror threat. There's a camera that's looking down at us right now. As a camera owner, I can show you what it looks like here. And in the summer, it's full of tables of picnic goers enjoying beers and beverages by the waterside. We're measuring the number of people, uh, the, the density. Uh, we're measuring speed of the crowds and the directions that they're moving. Personal data is not stored in the process. AI developer Markus Funstein explains that the algorithm anonymizes the visitors before the images are analyzed. So first of all, it's an open source solution. Um, second of all, um, here we just take the image, feed it into the algorithm, and a number comes out. And actually the number is the only thing that gets sent anywhere. The, the image does not touch any other computer than the ISO security certified server that we have. And even there, it is only stored for the brief second, millisecond that is needed in order to make the prediction. The Crowd Insights Monitor was developed before the COVID-19 pandemic, but the principles came in handy last year. For example, to check if park visitors were keeping within 1.5 meter social distancing circles. In the future, the system's algorithm could integrate statistics with weather or traffic data to predict how crowded the park will be, and how data is used should remain transparent. So the data that we're collecting now it can inform the public about what kinds of things should we be sharing, what kinds of things should we be collecting, what's okay, what's not okay. What data is collected, who has access to it, and for what purpose? These questions are key when it comes to building smart cities, especially because global tech companies are getting involved. One example is the Chinese telecommunications giant Huawei. Anthony Townsend explains why that's concerning. If you look at, at companies like Huawei, um, which are very aggressively trying to establish themselves globally in the smart city marketplace, uh, the places that they're targeting in the global south are almost completely unequipped to, to um, scrutinize these kinds of, of, of factors. And in many cases, Huawei is, is subsidizing the present costs of 
of these projects against future revenues. Um, and so cities are being offered a deal that's politically almost impossible to resist. Making countries dependent on tech without the proper safeguards. Critics call that type of exploitation digital colonialism. But the picture is not all grim. After all, big data can be instrumental in mitigating problems that affect our everyday lives. And some projects aim to empower citizens to analyze their own data in ways that benefit them. The Dutch Skies project on air pollution in Amsterdam is one example. A small device with sensors that measure air quality. That's essentially all one needs to participate in the citizen science project, Dutch Skies. The technology of the Smart Citizen Kit is kept simple for a reason. Individuals should be able to set it up themselves. An online platform collects and visualizes the measurements, so these kits help determine when air pollution is higher and lower. So uh, some of the participants have actually very concrete questions or concerns when they, when they are part of the project. For example, is it better to open my window on the front or on the back side of my house if I want to have fresh air? Uh, or what is the best route that I could take to bring my kids to school or to go to work or go for a run. Um, and even though it's quite hard to then actually pinpoint from the data what the exact answer is, it's definitely possible to get a, a better understanding. Judith Wienkamp is convinced the best way to find solutions is by fully including citizens and allowing them to work together with companies to make their cities future-proof. For me, that point is key. If so much of my personal data were being collected, I'd want to know how it's being used. Smart cities mean huge changes for residents. Concerns over invasive data collection and surveillance should be taken seriously. The responsibility lies not only with cities and governments, but with tech companies too. Many people distrust them, and not without reason. But without their expertise, it will be much harder to keep growing cities habitable. Smart city, a dream or a nightmare, let us know, but for now, goodbye.